Okay, I think we're set. With that, good evening, um, everyone. On behalf of the Lamb Foundation, welcome to the final session in what is now our third season of Lamposium in Your Living Room. My name is Charlene Dunn. I am the Director of Patient and Clinical Programs for the Foundation, and I will be your moderator this evening. To those of you joining us for the first time, a special welcome. To learn more about this educational series or to view recordings of previous presentations, be sure to check out our Lamposium in Your Living Room page on the Foundation's website. We have a positively fantastic program for you this evening as we are joined by our 2022 International LAM Research Conference co-chairs, Dr. Lisa Hensky, who is joining us from Boston, and Dr. Stephen Hamas, who is joining us from Rochester, New York. If you were fortunate enough to be in Chicago for our research conference and lamposium this past September, you no doubt heard these two dedicated longtime LAM investigators speak. And if you were not in Chicago, there is a good chance you have heard them previously here in our Lamposium in Your Living Room series, as they have both generously presented for us in the past. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsor, the National Disease Research Interchange, for their long-term continued support of this series. A couple of quick technical items. Microphones will be muted and the chat box disabled throughout our speakers' presentations. At the conclusion of their presentation, we will open the chat box for Q&A. Following Q&A, we will move into our patient and family group discussion. I encourage you to stay logged on for this opportunity to connect with fellow LAM community members from around the globe. And finally, for optimal viewing, I would suggest you select the speaker view option for the presentation, then switch to gallery view for our group discussion. And now it is my pleasure to formally introduce our speakers. Dr. Elizabeth Hensky is the director of the Center for Lamb Research and Clinical Care at Brigham and Women's Hospital. She is professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, an associate member of the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and a practicing medical oncologist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Doctor's lab, Dr. Hensky's laboratory discovered that LAM is caused by mutations in the tuberous sclerosis complex genes. She also was the first to discover that the TSC1 and TSC2 proteins physically interact. Her research laboratory is focused on the cellular, metabolic, and immunologic mechanisms underlying the pathogenesis of angiomyolipomas and LAM. Many of you in the greater Boston area and really beyond also know Dr. Hensky as co-director of our LAM clinic at Brigham and Women's. Dr. Stephen Hamas is a physician scientist who takes care of patients with endocrine and or hormonal problems and whose lab focuses on steroids and their roles in reproduction, cancer, and LAM. Specifically, he is interested in steroid production and steroid signaling in female and male reproductive tracts, as well as in steroid sensitive tumors. He is interested in both the positive and negative effects of androgens in the ovary with a focus on the pathophysiology and treatment of polycystic ovary syndrome. In addition, Dr. Hamas studies how androgens and other signals promote prostate cancer proliferation. And finally, Dr. Hamas is very interested in the origins and pathophysiology of LAM and serves on our scientific advisory board. Welcome to you both. I will now turn the mic over to you. Thank you, Char. I am so happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, share my slides. Just one moment. Hmm. All right, are you seeing my slides? Looks they good. are, yes. Looks Wonderful. Um, so I am so thank you for the introduction and I just wanna say how absolutely thrilled I am to be here and especially to be here with my good friend, Steve Hammes, um, who uh, helped plan this conference, which as you know, was held in September in Chicago. I just wanna also acknowledge the other 
co-organizer, Nishant Gupta, who all of you know, and mentioned that I planned this conference twice. So I was also involved in the planning of the 2020 conference with Frank McCormick and Greg Downey. And an exciting part of LAM from a scientific perspective is that a lot changed between 2020 and 2022, despite the pandemic. So we had new speakers with new data, things that wouldn't have even been possible in 2020. And I also want to say that I love the new LAM Foundation logo that emerged between um, 2020 and 2022. I think it's it's really captures LAM in a beautiful way. So this is the LAM conference snapshot that Char was nice enough to share with me earlier today. And we're going to be focusing on this part, the 102 professionals who attended the 28 scientific presentations and the 39 research posters and abstracts. And this is really just amazing to bring our community, our scientific and medical community together in this way to share what we have learned. And I also wanna give a huge, enormous thank you to, Sh to Sue Sherman and everyone at the Lamb Foundation. You guys are absolutely the best. I can't even begin to tell you how much goes into planning one of these conferences even before COVID and the commitment that the Lamb Foundation made to make this conference happen despite COVID was just admirable and inspiring and it worked. It was just a wonderful, wonderful gathering. So, so thank you all. I know it was a lot of extra work and um, it really, I think it really paid off. So this is the outline of what um, Steve and I are going to talk about briefly to capture just a few of the topics that were included in the scientific part of the conference. Those include the immune system in LAM, hormones in LAM, ways that we might ultimately be able to eliminate LAM cells and, and cure LAM, and then clinical trial design. How do we really get to another major breakthrough in LAM? What will that take? I like to think of um, LAM research kind of like a river. I'm actually in my, I should have mentioned that I'm in my dining room right now, not my living room, but I'm so happy to be with as many of you who are in your living rooms. And this river is the Charles River, which is just uh, maybe half a mile from our house. And this is a very famous race called the Head of the Charles Regatta. So there are a few things here that I think are, are uh, you know, maybe metaphors for what we're doing here tonight. First of all, the ideas and hypotheses and collaborations that started in Chicago in September through the conference are continuing. Almost every day I have meetings with people to talk about follow-up ideas, many of whom I, I didn't know before this meeting or hadn't met in person. And then also, I would say that we are very much a team. LAM uh, scientists and physicians are collaborating all the time, just like these eight rowers on the boat are collaborating. And then the last analogy is that we are working really hard to get there as fast as we possibly can. So if you don't remember anything else from tonight, please remember that with many, many thanks to the LAM Foundation. We are making a lot of progress and the conference initiates ideas and concepts that continue all over the world for um, until, we, until we figure things out. So just very briefly, since perhaps some of you might be new to LAM, let me just tell you what, what LAM is at the very most fundamental way. LAM can cause three things to happen in the lung. It can cause the lung to collapse, it can cause fluid to accumulate around the lung. And then it can cause damage to the delicate air sacs or alveoli that are the structures that allow oxygen molecules to move from the air into our capillaries, the small blood vessels where they're snatched up by hemoglobin molecules and allow oxygen to be transmitted all over our body. And these alveoli, these delicate air sacs, remind me of cherry blossoms. They're, they're 
very delicate structures and they can be damaged. And when they're damaged, that's one of our biggest concerns in lamb because we don't yet have a way to get those alveoli or air sacs back. So we're always trying to protect them in lamb. So I'll talk about three big questions that could lead to the next breakthrough in LAM, all of which involved new data that was presented in Chicago. First of all, why does LAM affect women <clears throat> and not men in general? Secondly, why do or how do LAM cells destroy those delicate air sac or, or lung cells, alveoli? And finally, what therapies will actually eliminate lamb cells, not suppress them. So I'm gonna show you the names and the cities of origin of some of the people who spoke about some of these topics. And then we'll come back to talk in a bit more detail about some of the new findings. So the, the issue of why lamb affects women was of course a big one. It remains a big topic and a lot of unknowns in this area. And we had speakers who are very familiar with LAM, like Jane Yu and Steve Thomas, and also some individuals who are experts in hormonal signaling, but are new to the LAM field, who can provide a perspective and perhaps lead to some new ideas. In terms of how do LAM cells destroy the lung cells, if we understood that better, we might be able to prevent that lung damage. And ideas in this area have arisen from several different groups, including Simon Johnson from Nottingham in the UK and from my lab in Boston. In terms of what therapies can actually eliminate lamb cells, a cure for lamb, there's a lot of work going on in the immune system in lamb. And some of that was presented by Tina Liu from Boston, Caroline Lapool from Chicago, and Steve Hammes, um, as well as others. And I would say that I, I'm guessing that many of my colleagues might be on this call, and um, I only captured a very small number. As you saw, there were something like 39 talks, and I've highlighted just about 10 of the speakers who fall into some of these categories but there were uh, many other topics and some people who aren't listed here who were involved in these particular topics. And I also hope that um, colleagues who are on the call will speak up because there's just no way that Steve and I can accurately capture all the information that was presented. And then uh, I think a very important part of this meeting was a panel discussion focused on the future of clinical trials in LAM. So I moderated this, Suhail El-Shamali, Nishant Gupta, and Simon Johnson were on the panel. And let me just show you this result from the famous MILES trial. You hear this referred to all the time. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011 um, and had about 30 authors, um, including Frank McCormick. And this trial was supported in part by the LAM Foundation. So in this trial, women with LAM were randomly assigned to get treatment with serolimus or to get treatment with a placebo. And it was called a double blind trial because neither the women on the trial nor their physicians knew which group they were in. And this blue line shows lung function in terms of the FEV1, the amount of air you can blow out in one second over one year of treatment. And if you were getting serolimus, those are the blue squares. And if you're getting the placebo, those are the white circles. So what you can see is that in one year of treatment on serolimus, the FEV1 was pretty stable in women who got serolimus and it declined just a bit in women who got the placebo. And then some of the women were observed for a whole year after the treatment was stopped and it was still blinded, meaning that they didn't know whether they had been receiving serolimus or the placebo. And over that period of time, lung function declined in women who had been on serolimus. And that's how we know that if you are on serolimus, you, we believe you need to stay on it to continue to get the benefit. And the lamb cells, if we stop the serolimus, will start to grow again and 
um, potentially cause damage to the lungs. Now, if we had a perfect treatment, it would eliminate the lamp cells, they would be gone. And in that case, if we stopped the treatment, lung function would stay the same. It would not decline off treatment. And that's what we're, we're looking for, something that will actually eliminate lamb cells and, and cure lamb. So to get there, it's pretty clear to me that we need more precise biomarkers. We need something that measures the burden of lamb cells more precisely than lung function and FEV1. So that was also, it's been a big topic at several other meetings that we've had, and it was a pretty big topic here. I really feel this is crucial for progress. And we heard about several different types of biomarkers that are, people are working on. We certainly don't have the answer to this yet, at least in my opinion, but David Kwiatkowski is working on this in terms of genetic biomarkers. Carmen Priolo and Brendan Manning are working on metabolic biomarkers and Aaron Gibbons, Jan Zhu and Simon Johnson are working on blood biomarkers and, and many more. So this is my last slide. Again, if you're only gonna remember one thing, remember that things that got started in Chicago are flowing like a river, that we are highly collaborative, like the people on these boats, and we are working as fast as we possibly can, just like they're trying to get to the finish line. And our goal is healthy lungs and a cure for lamb. That's what we're working toward. That's the finish line of this race. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing slides now. And um, I hope that you will have some questions for me at the end of this. Um, stop sharing. And okay. I'll turn it over to Steve. Well, that was great. Thank you, Lisa. I also wanna thank everybody for, for coming tonight and giving us a chance to talk a little bit about the research that's being done and research that was discussed at the meeting. I can only echo what Lisa said that, that you know, this is one of my favorite events to go to and it has been for many years and I miss being able to go in person because to interact with all these great scientists but also interact with all these amazing physicians and most of all, to interact with all the amazing people who are here on this call today, it's just, it's just an experience that's unmatched in any anything I've ever done. And so I greatly appreciate all the support from the patients and, and the support you give to the Lamb Foundation allows you know research grants that then so many of the people who presented at this meeting have been funded by the Lamb Foundation at some point in time and have used that as a jump start to get funding from the DOD or from the NIH. And so, you know, really the you know, Lamb Foundation and the patients and the families, they really are the linchpin that are driving this whole process. So they're the coxswain in, uh, mm -hmm. in your, your example, right? That keep us, keep us rowing as hard as we can. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate it. And I thought that was such a great overview by uh, Lisa that really, you know, covers the broadness of what we what we discussed. And what we thought we'd do now is go into a little more detail on each of those sections. And I guess we'll start where where we ended. And, you know, Lisa, you started to talk about clinical trials and and biomarkers. But we'll start with clinical trials. So, you know, what are the challenges now? Is it so easy to do those these kind of large double blinded studies like we did for serolimus? And if not, then what are some other approaches that, that we can take to try and test new therapies in lamb patients? Uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's what we tried to, um, during this panel discussion, I, I think we, my, my goal was to let everybody know what, what a barrier this might be to progress in lamb. We want everybody, the basic scientists, the every single person there to be thinking about this because we almost need everyone with a clinical trial idea to build into their research a biomarker that will let us know if their treatment is working or not. 
what's been happening in LAM from a clinical trials perspective, in in my view, anyhow, is that we had the LAM, the, the you know, the breakthrough miles trial, because at that point we didn't have any treatment for LAM at all. And so we were able to compare serolimus to a placebo. Now it's we're, it's a good thing. It's a good problem to have that we have serolimus that works really well. I don't, I didn't maybe highlight that as much as I should have, but it is an enormous breakthrough. It's, it's benefiting women with LAM all over the world every single day. They're living longer, healthier lives. It's, it's a miracle. But it means that the next step is harder because of course we can't compare to placebo because we have something that works. And that's meant that we've done quite a few early trials where we're not comparing to anything. We've done some of those in Boston, they've been done in Cincinnati, in New York, um, in South Carolina. There's a lot of um, interest. We have a lot of ideas of things that could work better than serolimus or could work together with serolimus. But using lung function, the FEV1, as our indicator of whether LAM is getting better or worse, is that's going to slow us down. So we'd like something more precise and that will change quickly to let us know if a new treatment is working better than serolimus. And that is um, the major need that we have. And we, I just wanted everyone in the room to know that we need to be thinking hard about that. And it's not a problem. No, no one here that I'm aware of has an answer to that. There is some um, interest in maybe changing the way clinical trials are done. And that's something else we could consider. Um, people have talked about doing so-called N of one clinical trials. And that means that each woman with LAM fundamentally serves as her own control. It also requires biomarkers. But I think we need to think creatively as a whole community about how to make sure that we're ready for the next breakthrough, to test the next breakthrough in women who have LAM. Great. But Thanks. Steve, what, what, what do you think, Steve? You might have other ideas so, from you your know, I think perspective. We, I think we feel similarly about this. And I think the, the point is that the, the reason you get cystic lung disease and the reason that you lose your FEV1 is because of these LAM tumor cells that are in the lungs. And so really, when you're trying to design treatments, you're not trying to repair cysts, you're trying to kill those cells. If in an idea, so serolimus will stop those cells, but it doesn't kill them. And so the biomarkers aren't necessarily coming from the lung. They may be coming from mm -hmm. the cells themselves, these tumor cells you're trying to kill, or maybe some surrounding cell that's interacting with the tumor cells. So really thinking it at a, in a, at a molecular basis and looking at tumor burden, I, I think we all would agree is is maybe that can is a faster look. It's like heart disease. You, you can wait for somebody to have a heart attack in 20 years, or you can measure their cholesterol and their blood pressure. And you can say, these are all markers that tell us bad things are going to happen. And if we control those markers, we have evidence that that's going to slow down heart disease. And so I think so with that in mind, you know, a lot of a lot of the conversation, a lot of the talks at this meeting did focus a little bit on biomarkers that are available in the blood. And for example, there's VEGF, which people use now. There's this other molecule, GPNMB, which which both of our labs actually work on, which maybe another, it's 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 synthesized on the cells and then it's secreted into the blood and you can just measure it in a very simple assay. So we're interested in looking at that, maybe a combination of the two, but another, so there are cellular biomarkers people are looking at, some enzymes that are also secreted by these cells, but there were also some conversations on, um, on imaging that might perhaps focus on the tumor cells. And so rather than measuring how many cysts you have, maybe we can measure tumor burden in other ways. And I don't know if you wanna comment a little bit on that, Lisa. Yeah, we're, you know, we're pretty excited about this um, study that's going on at Mass General right now, which is led by Carmen Priolo. That's using a novel kind of PET scan, different than the usual PET scans. It seems to work very well in mice and, you know, taking the step between studies in mice, mm -hmm. the studies in humans is really important, very time consuming and challenging. Again, Carmen's had support from, from the LAM Foundation to do this. 
So, so yeah, many of us think that imaging biomarkers could be an important part of solving this solving this puzzle. In terms of things like GPNMB, Steve, um, like how what is the next step for that? How how do you see that unfolding? So that's a good question. So we so we have a uh, you know, so we made a mouse model for lamb where we um and maybe we can talk more about that at some other point. But we made a mouse model for lamb where we knocked out tuberous sclerosis gene in, in the uterus actually, and they got lamb tumors in the uterus. But one of the signals that was markedly upregulated and also estrogen dependent, by the way, was GPNMB, which is this marker that you normally see in melanoma and some other cancers. But for some reason, it's markedly upregulated. And it's, and it's one of these many melanocytic markers that have been described in lamb cells, like the one that HMB45 recognizes that people used to use more frequently when they were staining lamb samples. But what's interesting about GPNMB is it's it sits on the cell surface of these of these tumors, but then it gets released off the cell surface and it ends up in the blood. And so we discovered that it was not only we could see it not only in the tumors, but we could see it in the blood of our mice. And then Lisa's lab was that I you know talking about how we work together. I mentioned it to Lisa and she immediately volunteered to send us some samples from patients who were on serolimus, who were off serolimus. So you know, different stages of lamb so that we could see whether this marker was present. And in general, it was actually a little higher in patients with lamb. Some patients, it's very high. But I think what was more interesting is when Lisa sent us patients who would, who were not on serolimus or who were off serolimus and then started serolimus, you, and everyone but one, you saw a reduction in GPNMB when you were treating with serolimus, which makes sense because it does slow down the growth of these tumors and slows down the expression and release of this protein. So there are some examples, there are other examples like that as well. And both of our labs are really interested in using this as a biomarker. And Lisa's lab is also very interested in trying to understand how it's regulated. And so, you know, there are ideas like this and hopefully many more that we'll discover in these preclinical mouse models that then we can then use to then move into patients and see whether they're present there as well. So we were very lucky, just, it was luck. But it worked out. <laughs> you have to do the experiment, and then you had to recognize the luck. But that knockout mouse we made was a pilot award from the Lamb Foundation, you know, ten or twelve years ago. Again, showing how far the a pilot award can really go. Maybe Steve, since um, you could talk a little bit more about about hormones and Lamb. So, for those of you who don't know, one of the great things about bringing Steve into the uh, Lamb community is that he's an endocrinologist who has a lot of expertise in understanding estrogen signaling. And you know you can't tell anyone about Lamb um, without them wondering, you know, sitting next to someone on a flight, for example, and you tell them what you do, and they immediately have ideas about why Lamb might be affecting only women. So Steve, where do where do we stand on that? What did we what you invited a lot of really great people to the conference? Um, where, where do you tell us about that? Sure. So, you know, I think that most people feel that at least in some patients, estrogen really seems to regulate um, lamb. Some people have worse symptoms depending upon their cycle. Some people get considerably better when you suppress estrogen production or you remove the ovaries. And, and interestingly, and what's really interesting is almost a large majority of patients after menopause, they seem to see a slowing of the progression of lamb, which again would suggest maybe estrogen is playing a role in it. not everybody, but in a large number. So, so you know, there, it really does suggest that estrogen is important. But interestingly, there hasn't been a really big clinical trial looking at younger patients with lamb, where you try, you know, much like you do with breast cancer, where you you can eliminate estrogen production, and and then there's still always some debate about which patients you should use. And again, how are you going to do that clinical trial as we just discussed? And, you know, do you really have to have a control group? And if patients do so well on serolimus, is, is getting rid of estrogen going to make a big difference, right? So there's a lot of issues in doing a clinical trial. But I think one point I'll make before we talk a little bit about what was presented is that men have estrogen too. And during most times in the cycle, men have just as much estrogen as women do. And it's only when women are right around the time of ovulation that they have a big surge in estrogen. So you can't say that all, that the vast majority of lamb patients are women because of estrogen, right? Just like 
breast cancer isn't caused by estrogen. Estrogen is a fuel that drives it. And in the same way with lamb, it's very unlikely that estrogen causes lamb. The tissues, these tumor cells that are in the lungs just seem are perhaps sensitive to estrogen. So, but they have to get there in the first place. Again, women get breast cancer because they have breasts, not because they have estrogen. Likewise, whatever these lamb cells are, whatever the origin is, it seems like it's more present in women than in men. And so one thought is, you know, that, that, that's that been discussed. And what our mouse model was, was to create lamb in the uterus and see if perhaps that can metastasize to the lungs. And in fact, in our mouse model, it did. And now with some RNA sequencing data in humans, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, when you look at the lamb cells in the lungs, they do look a lot like uterine cells. So that doesn't mean that they come from the uterus, but they look like uterine cells. And again, it may be some developmental program that affects more women than men. But what we really want to try and understand then is what can, you know, how is estrogen affecting these uterine-like cells or, or whatever they are? So we brought in a lot of experts who study steroid hormone signaling in the breast, steroid hormone signaling in the uterus. They study steroid effects on fibroids, which are, you know, uterine tumors that are estrogen sensitive and actually by, you know, looking under a microscope, look a lot like lamb lesions. And, um, and you know, we learned a lot of really interesting things that we hadn't really thought about before, looking at how estrogen signals to drive these cells to grow, how other hormones might modulate estrogen signaling. And also, they, people have been studying what's called epigenetics. So we think about genetics, which is changes in DNA, but there's, ep, you know, the actual DNA sequencing or sequences, but then there's epigenetics, which is modifications of DNA that then affect the way that they can express proteins and affect the way that they behave. And so we heard a really interesting talk on how epigenetics in the uterus can vastly change the way that uterine tissue behaves, making us think that perhaps focusing on epigenetics in these lamb cells might also lead to some interesting stuff. And there are people who are working on this. And we, I think all of us would agree that it's you can't just focus on the DNA, you can't just focus on the protein, you gotta focus on everything. Right. So, so we got a lot of really, um, we got a lot of really, I think, high quality work in other fields that we can then take into our own. And the only other thing I'll mention, which I've been thinking about a lot since the meeting, and because I think you heard in the introduction that our lab is very interested in androgens, is that, you know, autoimmune diseases are much more common in women than men. And people have always said it's because estrogen somehow is stimulating the immune system. But a lot of evidence now suggests that it's because testosterone in men is actually shutting it down. Mm. And so, you know, I keep going back to our mouse model and thinking, man, we got to treat those mice with testosterone just to see if we can slow growth. It's an experiment that I think of every year. Whenever I have this lamb eating, I remember I'm supposed to to do that experiment. But there's a lot we still don't understand about hormones. And so I think this meeting was really fun. And I hope that some of the people who were present in the meeting will continue to stay involved in LAM. And I've already been in touch with many of them, trying to keep them interested. You know, when I'm sitting next to someone on a plane, you know, not a scientist or anything, and I tell them about LAM, they often ask me whether we think testosterone might be suppressing LAM. So I think you're onto something. It's embarrassing that. that I literally have had a career studying testosterone and I haven't done it. <laughs> I, I, and I just said it to 200 people, right? <laughs> so now, now you're on the hook. You got to do it. <laughs> right now I got to go so, back. So Steve, you just said we have to understand, you know, the whole picture. Um, and you've been working on estrogen a bit and the immune system. A lot of the new things that have happened since 2020 actually involve how how the immune system might be involved in lamb you mentioned it also in the context of autoimmune disease so maybe you could talk a little bit about you know what's happening with the immune system and lamb sure well you know both of us study the immune system and lamb but different parts of the immune system and like many things it's probably super complicated but the general thought is that in a lot of cancers and a lot of diseases, it's turning out that you can't always focus just on the tumor cells. Sometimes that microenvironment is playing an important role and immune cells are one such part of the microenvironment. And we got kind of interested in this because in our mouse model, the lamb, the tumors were would disappear 
if you got rid of estrogen. And then we would take those cells out of the animal and put them in a test tube and try and stimulate them with estrogen. And we saw really pretty modest responses. It didn't make sense. And so it made us wonder whether estrogen might be doing something else in the mice. So we did actually um, find that what estrogen does is it stimulates what are called neutrophils, which is basically that rapid, sometimes called innate immunity that everybody has when they get infected by a bacteria, that those first responders that go in there and try and clean things up. But the problem is that a lot of tumor cells love inflammation and love the first responders, and it actually makes them grow more. And so what we found is that estrogen stimulates those first responders, and then they proceed to, rather than kill the tumor cells, they actually seem to stimulate them to grow more. But we're trying to understand that because if we can somehow slow down these first responders or figure out how they're killing the cells, maybe we can figure out ways to suppress them and try and control the progression of lamb. And I think um, that's the rapid responders, but then there are the more long-term responders that are supposed to kill cells, but don't always do it. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that, Lisa. Well, yeah, I guess one, you know, one consequence of learning a lot more about lamb over the past couple of years is that many groups are now focusing on the other cells in the lung, not just the lamb cells, but everything else. And I think that's going to be part of the solution, really, because some of those um, other cells, like the immune cells, can be targeted therapeutically. And we see that clearly in cancer. Um, you can't watch TV anymore without seeing advertising for some of the drugs that work very effectively in many ty types of cancer that basically help your immune cells do a better job of recognizing and destroying the cancer cells. And some of those drugs might also have efficacy in lamb. So there's a lot of excitement about understanding the immune system better in lamb with the ultimate goal of harnessing the power of your own white blood cells to eliminate the lamb cells. And uh, many people, Vera Krumskaya, um, your group, um, uh, Caroline Lapool and others um, are uh, Michael Borchers and in Cincinnati. People are all, all, all working on this. The immune system is very complicated and each of us are kind of working on different cells right now. And hopefully we can all like, you know, get on the same boat and figure it out in a, in a single way. But right now it's, it's involving a lot of little pieces of the immune system to understand them better and really get a handle on what's going on there. So one thing we haven't talked about yet um, is why the lungs are destroyed in lamb. And um, that's something that Simon Johnson from Nottingham has been working on and more recently our lab also. And there's, there are enzymes called cathepsins that are present in lamb cells. That's been known for a long time. And these cathepsins, one of their jobs in the body is to degrade bone. And so Simon Johnson and our lab and others are thinking that maybe these pathepsins, which are in the lamb cells, are actually involved in degrading the normal lung cells, the, you know, those delicate cherry blossom-like cells. And Simon has been able to model some of this in cells in culture and in mice and even detect some of the cathepsins in the bloodstream. So I think we're making progress on that. I think it, estrogen could also be involved in that process in ways that we don't, we don't quite understand. So it's um, a, definitely a work in progress. Do you think that cathepsin is being made by the tumor cells themselves or is it made from other cells sitting in the micro environment as we call it? Well, that's a tricky question because we definitely think it's being made by the lamb cells. But one thing we've learned from the single cell RNA sequencing that uh, was really, again, the, the, the gift of the Lamb Foundation to our community um, exactly. is that cathepsin K is also present in, in one of the types of white blood cells in lamb, which is called a macrophage. So again, you know, each, each major step we take can lead to additional really pivotal questions. And so one of those is where exactly the cathepsin K is coming from. So I wanna talk a little bit about our you know, early career investigators. Um, 
the people who are just getting started in research. This was a really important meeting for them because they have not, over the past two or three years, they have not had the chance to meet other LAM investigators in person. And um, I think one, one takeaway from, from me from the, the meeting in Chicago was that in-person is a lot better than Zoom in terms of connections. And I mean, it's just, it's a whole different world. So um, I don't know, Steve, if you want to talk a little bit about some of the ways that early, our early investigators, this is our, you know, our brilliant young people who are going to bring new ideas and energy and, and solutions to critical problems. So do you want to send it to Steve about, sure. you know, how they were sure. involved? So I think that this is, this is a passion of both of us, I would say, is training the next generation and watching them be successful. And I think both of us feel like watching Watching the trainees become independent is is probably one of the greatest joys of, of of being a scientist and so and a mentor. So so I both of us thought a lot about that as we were putting together this program. And so we did a number of different things to try and um to try and really help these early career researchers get going. So one thing we did is um is we had a very robust poster session. So what you do is you have a session where where um, individuals can present their work in the form, it's literally in the form of a poster and they post them up and then the faculty all come and they walk around that room and they look at all the posters and they interact with all the trainees and we all take it very seriously. And there's a reception. So there's other in, 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 enticements to get us to go, but really all the faculty participate. It's, a, it's sort of the highlight of the meeting. And we, and you know, I probably saw, I didn't see all 39 posters, but I probably saw, you know, 25 or 30 of the 39 and, and they were all just amazing. And you get to talk to the investigators and they can tell you what they're doing. And it's, it's really wonderful. And I can tell you that my graduate student who hadn't really interact, had knew all the names, but had never met any of the people in the land field. And in that poster session, she met them all. It was like the encyclopedia or it was the it was the directory of all of our collaborators and all these great scientists. And she was just so excited and got a lot of great ideas and came home really charged to work. The other thing we did is we actually looked at some of the at the abstracts for these posters and we picked a we selected a, several of them and, and gave those speakers 10 minute talks along with, we slipped them right into all the talks from the main speakers so that they would get a chance to speak in front of people, get that experience, but also get the feedback. And I think that went really, really well as, as well. And they really loved it. And the fourth thing we did, which I will admit, I was very much against when we talked about it, but Lisa wanted to do it and a couple other people wanted to do it. So we did it. And that was, we had these one minute talks where, where some of these, where the trainees and young investigators would get to come up and they had to sell their science in one minute. They were allowed one slide and a one minute talk. And I thought it was just gonna be chaos. And it was chaos, but it was controlled and exciting chaos. And everybody loved doing it. And we all had sort of had fun with it. And, and all, you know, it was near the end of the day. So everybody was a little giddy anyway. And, and we learned a lot of science and it got us excited to go see their posters. And the trainees, I think, just really love the opportunity to get up there. So I think, you know, I was against it. And now I want more for the next meeting because I think it was a great idea. And again, that was, that was Lisa and others. It was not me. <laughs> so what, what other things does the LAMP Foundation do, Lisa, to try and encourage new investigators and young investigators? Yes, the, the Land Foundation has started an early career investigator series. Um, so they've had a chance to meet together, especially during COVID. I hope that that helped them feel connected to each other. And I believe there was also a special reception for the early stage career um, folks also to let them get to know each other. And we, I mean, we we really need them. <laughs> they're not a, they're not a luxury. They are essential to, to bringing new ideas and, um, and things to our to our community, so we're we're very happy to have them have them in the mix. So maybe Shar, we can turn it back to you at this point. Yes. And, um, yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah, you guys. Some questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
first of all, that is amazing and dense and accessible all at the same time. So I'm very I don't thankful. want to do that. I don't want that word. Well, <laughs> in the most positive way, a lot of information shared in a in a relatively short period of time coming out of a two and a half day conference for you both. So thank you very much for going back three months in time and recapping for us. We have had a fair number of people who logged on partway into the presentation. So I have a couple of questions that if we could maybe approach them in kind of a recap summary while we open the chat box. So two things happening simultaneously here. If team, if we could go ahead and open the chat box and community, you can start to enter questions. And then in the meantime, I'll pose a couple of questions and that we have touched on. So again, kind of in recap, if we could, uh, both of you answer, um, what are some of the most exciting things that changed between 2020 in that original slide that you had, Lisa, with the 2020 conference and then 2022? And then kind of segueing off of that, what are what might the community expect to happen in the next year or two? So if, if you guys wanna split that or tackle part of it, um, just to kind of recap where we've been in this first 50 minutes. You want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Well, I can start. Maybe I'll talk about some of the things that I think are different between 2020 and 2022, sure. since I was involved in thinking about sure. both of those conferences. Um, I really would highlight two things. I think we've learned a lot more about the immune system, and we talked a bit about that, that the immune system in LAM appears a bit similar to the immune system in cancer in that it seems that the immune cells in LAM are actually helping the LAM cells grow. And the immune cells includes the neutrophils and the macrophages and the T cells. And that's important because that might mean that we could so-called repurpose some of the drugs that are now very, very successful in cancer to help the immune cells in LAM do their job and their job should be to recognize and destroy the LAM cells. So we're moving forward on that and a lot of different people are now excited about that. And that's what we need to answer every big question. We need a lot of different people to be working on it. And the second thing that's changed is that we now have three um, single cell RNA sequencing data sets available from Cincinnati, from the University of Pennsylvania and from Boston. And these single cell data sets are a wonderful resource for our community. It's kind of like having, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica of LAM that was published in very recent, very recently for LAM that allows us to, you know, if we want to study one of these immune cells, we now can go to the encyclopedia and look it up and learn about that immune cell in human LAM. We couldn't, we couldn't do that. Uh, before. We now have three of these data sets, and it, it's really opening up a lot of doors for our scientific and research community. So those are two of the things that I think are really different between 2020 and 2022. Great. Yeah, I think that for the younger people, that would be the Wikipedia. Um, uh, Wikipedia, yes. <laughs> right, right. We're dating ourselves. <laughs> like Wikipedia. Some people are going, what's that? <laughs> but, but but the other thing that I think came up at this meeting by somebody who wasn't in land, this woman Zainab Madek Erdogan, who's a really interesting young scientist, is you know even the single cell RNA sequencing, which is giving us a ton of information, is already becoming yesterday's technology because now there are actually techniques where you can do the same thing on a slide where you're actually looking at the lamb cells where they are in the lung next to the alveolar cells and next to the immune cells. So you can actually, you can actually do the same experiment and you can look, you can localize where in the tissue it's happening. So you can get even more information and you can even look at proteins that are expressed in those regions. And there's new technology where you can look at metabolism as it's localized in just a slide that you get from a patient. And so what really is changing so quickly that I personally am unable to keep up with it at all. Thank goodness there are younger, smarter people who are doing this, but there's this new technology and we have these huge data sets that we can now utilize to try and understand how LAM works. And so I'm very excited that, that things are gonna move very quickly as we learn. Our biggest problem is figuring out what to do with all these data, but there's a lot of information we can now gather. So I think that's a big difference that's just gonna to continue to grow. By the next one, we'll have a lot more exciting, interesting data. 
Great. Thank you both very much. And the chat box is filling. So we'll just uh, take off at the top and go from there. So first question, do the LAM clinical trials require the exhaustive clinical study protocol protocols, IRB approvals, et cetera? I'm going to let you handle that one. <laughs> the answer, I think, um, is yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we definitely, um, I can't envision doing clinical trials without the IRB and a lot of what's referred to as regulatory work. And we, we, we need that, though. We want to be very safe and rigorous with everything we do. Great. Thank you. Um, next, we have a, a question about the build of the cancer-like cells that we've talked about in regards of LAM and the es potential estrogen connection. Um, this woman has recently been diagnosed with breast cancer and wondering about um, that connection. So I could start. I, you know, I think that they're, you know, based on everything we can tell, a LAM cell is completely different than a breast cancer cell except that they both appear to have, at least the diseases appear to have some, some, of, some of them have some estrogen sensitivity. And I think that's kind of the most important caveat to all of this estrogen talk is that it's probably not equally important in everybody. Just like some breast cancers are super sensitive to estrogen and respond really well when you take away estrogen, some breast cancers don't care and they're not estrogen sensitive. They don't even have estrogen receptors. Now, what's interesting in LAM is so far, to my knowledge, whenever we look, they have estrogen receptors. So it may be that a higher percentage of patients with LAM will have some estrogen sensitivity, but you know, they're two very different tumors, but they respond, interestingly, they respond and proliferate to, in, in response to estradiol. But again, my own bias is that LAM cells are probably a little bit more like a uterine cell, but what does estrogen do? It stimulates cells in the uterus and makes them grow just like it stimulates cells in the uh, breast to grow. So they're two, I, in my eyes, they're two very different diseases. And I'm sorry that you have to deal with both at the same time, because obviously that's a hugely stressful thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, here's one that begins with a huge thank you for the excellent talks. And a question, if we could please expound a bit on the potential role of cathepsins in LAM, and could it be related to early onset osteoporosis in premenopausal LAM women? Hmm. That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. So, um, yeah, so, so we, we believe, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, that cathepsins are made by the LAM cells. And they may also be made by some of the immune cells in LAM. And I have also been wondering recently whether the cathepsins that are made by LAM cells might be contributing to osteoporosis, but it, it's complicated because osteoporosis could be related to other features involved in LAM. So I don't think anyone has tried to sort that out yet, but it's a, it's a very interesting question and one that has come up in discussions among the scientific community. The one thing I'll add is I can put on my endocrinologist hat because we take care of a lot of osteoporosis. So, you know, bones are always breaking down and reforming. So normal amounts of cathepsin are actually absolutely necessary for bones to break down and reform. Everybody's skeleton, you know, during their, you know, the, the majority of their life is turning over every few years. You're literally destroying the old one and building a new one. And you need cathepsins to do that. And so I don't know whether cathepsins are necessarily bad or good in the bone. I can tell you that in some of the studies using cathepsin inhibitors, that actually causes osteoporosis in the bones because you don't have that appropriate turnover. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really complicated question, but it, it's, it's important, that connection's important as we try and understand, well, how can we then treat it if the cathepsins are important without also affecting the bone? So I think it's, a, it's really astute to think about that interaction, because I think it's going to be really important. Great. Thank you. And we have a question from one of our women who uh, was in Chicago for the conference, and she's asking about the lymphatic involvement, um, or LAM as a lymphatic disease, and recognizing that there were a number of talks about LAM, the lymphatic involvement. Could you talk a little bit more about that side of LAM and what we know? Hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Steve, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> I was going to punch it to you. I was hoping you'd 
you know, it's not something that's my expertise, unfortunately. Yeah. I, don't know I, I would I say that, you know, we, we know there's a lot going on with lymphatics in lamb. And one of the best examples of that is the very high levels of vascular endothelial growth factor D, VEGFD. It's elevated in about two thirds of women who have lamb. And that is the growth factor for the lymphatic channels, which carry lymph from one part of your body to another. And also if we look microscopically at lamb, we see a lot of lymphatic channels in and around the lamb cells. But it seems that we have not really figured out yet exactly why those lymphatic channels are there. And we have not yet, as far as I know, figured out how we can therapeutically utilize them to get better treatments for lamb. So I, I think that that is still an area where we need a lot more, a lot more research. Great, understood, thank you. Um, shifting gears, we have a question about um, AI and coming from one of our ladies who works has worked in the tech industry and she's wondering about alternate measures of disease burden and progression. And have we looked at measuring lamb tumors or cyst total mass um, I think she came on the late. Could collaboration with one of the emerging visual AI companies, for example, Microsoft, accelerate our effort, efforts here? So we yeah. didn't have speakers, I don't think this meeting, right? But in previous meetings, you know, I think this is a very, it's a great point. And it's, a, it's actually an active area of research, trying to develop uh, AI techniques to measure cysts volume and to look for subtle changes and and you know, looking at CT scans or other types of scans. So, I mean, maybe you can say, maybe you know a little more, Lisa, but I know that this is something that has been presented in the past at the meetings and is certainly something that's being worked on. Yes, Dr. Moss has been working on this among others. And I think it is a very, um, you know, that, that could be one of the things that gives us a quantitative biomarker. So definitely worth paying attention to. Right, thank you. And um, here's another one from, we're going to shift gears again, I'm wondering about additional studies or information pertaining to ceasing periods in our younger women with lamb. And um, this woman's daughter is receiving shots to stop her periods and to help balance the hormones. Is there, or do we have any additional studies or any new information on that, the success or not of that type of treatment? So, you know, again, I think in, in some people, it has a profoundly positive effect. And so I think in some people, it really seems to make a difference. But then in other people, you know, maybe not as much. But, you know, I do think so. She's what, the, what, what she's probably getting are shots that basically shut down the ability of, the, of your, your brain to talk to your ovary to tell it to make estrogen. And so that tends to decrease the estrogen levels quite a bit. And, and there have been patients who have that or just have their ovaries removed and, and really see a reduction in symptoms. So I think most of us believe estrogen is important. What we really want to do is figure out in which patients is it most important so that we can, you know, maybe we can have a more directed clinical trial where we take patients who we think will benefit the most. And then maybe you can do a short study and see a great effect. The great thing about the estrogen removal, like it's rather than surgery, the treatment is if it doesn't work or it doesn't help or the patient doesn't feel well, you can stop the treatment and within a few months, everything will return back to how it was. So if you're going to do something, I'd rather do that than a surgery, for example, which is irreversible. So, but, you know, I think the jury is, the, the, we, you know, those studies still need to be done. We just want to make sure we do them right. Very true. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about a drug called Keytruda. I'm going to spell it because I'm not certain I'm pronouncing it correctly. K-E-Y-T-R-U-D-A. And immunotherapy um, exploration. Do we have any data on women that have been on this drug or is similar for reasons other than LAM and or on LAM and what might have been the effect? So yes, yeah, so Keytruda is one of the immune therapy agents that I alluded to earlier um, that are used in many different forms of cancer and that help your cancer cells um, be recognized by the immune system and allow the immune system to eliminate the cancer cells. 
And we have evidence from mouse models that agents like that might be effective in lamb, but we don't have any evidence from women with lamb at this point that there is, is benefit to those drugs. And those drugs have a lot of toxicity. And although you might think that we could learn something from women who, who have lamb and who also have cancer and might be getting those drugs, to my knowledge, no one has yet been able to compile data in a useful way, but maybe that will happen in the future. Thank you. Thank you both. This question, our next one is about the kidneys and the basic question for us all to develop a better understanding is why does lamb impact the kidneys with the AMLs and are, is anyone studying that? Mm -hmm. So that's actually how I originally yeah, I was gonna say, got involved in lamb because <laughs> I am just fascinated by the kidney tumors called angiomyolipomas that occur in lamb and also occur in tuberous sclerosis. And we know for sure that those kidney tumors are very closely related to lamb. The cells in the kidney tumor seem identical to the cells in the lung in lamb. And we also know that the mutations in the tuberous sclerosis 2 gene that occur in the kidney tumors are the same mutations that are present in the lamb cells. But we do not know the answer to that question. Why are these cells in the kidney and the lung, and we would just we would just love to know why they end up in those particular places. Where do they come from? What what type of cell do they derive from? What is the cell of origin? And I think all of those questions again need we need more research to understand that better. Oops, that's muted. Thank you. I'm um, we have a lot of questions, so I am scrolling <laughs> just a little bit and. Um, So there is a there is a clarification clarification question we have about the cathepsins, and they we're asking for a little clarification on the word itself. What is it? Um, and just a little maybe expound on that just a tad. Well, I have a, a lay a lay terminology that I like to use as an analogy for, for cathepsins. They're they're kind of like Drano. And they are, they and many other enzymes are stored in cells in a structure called a lysosome that kind of keeps them from seeping out and damaging the cell itself or a neighboring cell. So they're, they're it's like having a little bottle of Drano, you know, bottles of Drano have a thick cover and a tight cap. And so cathepsins are kept inside the cell in a structure called a lysosome. And then when a, like a bone, if bone remodeling is needed, as Steve was talking about earlier, then they are released in a controlled way into the environment right around the cell. Is that, is that seem like it's answering the question, Shar? I'm not I'm sort of forgetting what exactly the- Yeah, no, I, I, think, I think you nailed it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it was just a little clarification on what exactly we're talking about with that. I think that's a great analogy. Um, thank you. And we have a question here uh, referencing the testosterone angle that was mentioned earlier. And the, the comment is some birth controls involve, some birth control pills rather involve testosterone. Um, could we test with that? Um, is that? Is that an option? And then uh, it's have rates or intensities of lamb between women who have been pregnant and those who have not been studied uh, or numbers of pregnancies being that pregnancy has immune responses involved. Does that, did that come through? <laughs> That's a lot of stuff. Let me try. Yeah, and they're, they're it. Just a little. <laughs> yeah. Let me try and pick it apart. So one birth control pills do not have testosterone in them. They have estrogen or, an, or they have something like estrogen, usually it's synthetic estrogen. And then they have a progestin. Some of the, and in fact, some of the progestins, actually progesterone receptor and testosterone receptor are similar. So some progestins will, you know, make people's, you know, acne a little bit worse and things like that, but they're not really testosterone and they're not really androgen, but a lot of them actually do the opposite and block testosterone effects. So for women with polycystic ovary syndrome, the way we treat them to get their testosterone down is we put them on birth control. And what it does is it shuts down the ovaries 
So they stop making anything. And the only hormones in your body, the only sex hormones in your body are the birth control. So birth control doesn't have testosterone, but there are, again, there's not like a controlled study that shows this, but there's lots of evidence to suggest that in patients, many patients with lamb, when they go on birth control, it actually can cause the lamb to get worse. Same with pregnancy. There are some women who, when they get pregnant, the, uh, their lamb seems to get worse. But again, it's not everybody. So I think that, um, and as far as immune responses, rejecting the fetus, I mean, I'm not aware that, I mean, I don't think we have a big enough numbers, but I'm not aware that patients in LAM have any higher incidences of, um, of you know, premature, you know, of losing the pregnancies early, unless, of course, they have significant other medical problems like a collapsed lung or something else which puts stress on the body. So, so I think that, you know, you need to have a lot of estrogen to main, and progesterone to maintain a pregnancy. And so you're going to be in a high estrogen state for nine months, right? And there's just no way around it. And so I think those patients who are sensitive, that's something that you always want to talk about with your physician. That's a risk you got to know about. We have a lot of patients now, I've been getting a lot of emails for patients who want to basically donate their, get, you know, get a you know, basically take their eggs in their spouse's sperm and then have somebody else carry the child. And I think that that's a, a surrogate pregnancy. And I think that there are ways now that you can induce ovulation without raising estrogen at all. And so I think that there's, you know, that's another option to consider if you're worried about the estrogen or you're very sensitive to it. Thank you. And I'm, I'm looking at the the time here we're at eight. Yeah, wow, it's just yeah, I know it's crazy. It's eight ten Eastern time. So I think I'm going to go with two more questions from the chat box. We do just so everyone knows we are able to preserve the chat from this evening. And there are also some wonderful comments in here. And thank you. So um Dr. Hensky and Dr. Thomas, I'll make sure that we get the chat out to you to can I say one it. thing just yeah. before there is a question about tamoxifen, mm -hmm. serolimus, and I mean, this is something I think that is worth talking to your physician about because tamoxifen is an agonist in the uterus and it actually stimulates uterine cells to grow. And so there are other ways to block estrogen that don't involve tamoxifen. And I think it's worth having a conversation with your physician about that because I would probably choose a different blocker of estrogen just to be on the safe side because we don't really know what tamoxifen does in lamb, but theoretically, it could make it worse rather than better. So I would just have a conversation with your physician. There's lots of other options. I wanted to make sure I mentioned that. Yeah, thank you. That that actually is a question that comes in to the foundation often, Steve. So thank you for picking up on that. So I have two questions I'll put out. And if you two would just please select which one you want to field here before we close for the evening. Um, an interesting question a little bit further down is, do we know why lamb shows up in women in their early 30s and not earlier. And I know that we do have a range of ages, but maybe if we could talk a little bit about that. And then also a fantastic question from one of our women who has been around the foundation for a long time is, um, will we be getting uh, opening trials or studies soon where we can reach out to our patients and ask for their participation? Why don't you handle the second one first? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's an answer to that one. <laughs> right? I would just say that um, we, we are so grateful to the women who participate in clinical trials. We couldn't, we couldn't make any progress. We would not be where we are today without the courage of the 90 women who participated in the MILES trial that I showed earlier. And the women who are right at this moment on the mild trial, um, we just overwhelming gratitude to these women who are making breakthroughs possible for, for everyone, everyone with LAM. So we definitely hope there will be continuing trials and um, we, we need everyone to be um, aware of, of what's going on with the trials. It's been one of the great things about the LAM Foundation and, and the research conference and Lamposium that when trials launch, the women who have LAM are very aware in most cases of exactly why we're doing the trial, the data that led up to the trial and the importance of the trial. So, so thank you, thank you to everyone who has participated and who is interested in the clinical trials that will be coming forward 
um, over the next few years because that is fundamentally how we've made the progress that we are so lucky to have today in land and the progress that we'll be making moving forward. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hensky. Great. Do you want me to, I, I can try and tackle the first one, which is age, you know, and I think that the, at least in my very simplistic mind, you know, thing, land cells grow slowly and it takes a long time for them to get to the size and the number where they can cause lung disease. So the problem is it goes back to biomarkers and detection. You know, what do we use to diagnose, you know, how do we screen patients for LAM and like TSC patients, we do CT scans. So by the time you see it, it's been pretty, it's already late in the game, if theoretically, right? That the, and so I just think that this is another example of why we really need sensitive biomarkers, not just to follow progression, but maybe to find it earlier. Uh, the, the mild trial was just mentioned. It could be that if you take somebody with early stage lamb that you can treat them with a low dose of serolimus and maybe you can prevent it from really ever being a problem, right? So figuring out other biomarkers where we can pick it up early is gonna be critical because it's happening before we can see it. And we're still, we're still kind of in the dark ages. We're using very big, you know, big, you know, basically clubs to try and find it. And what we really need is a, is a really sensitive knife that can find it really, really easily. So, so that's really another plug for biomarkers and for research to look for better, more sensitive biomarkers. Very good. Thank you. It's very exciting to hear your excitement about what's happening in the, the field of LAM research. So to close before I introduce our executive director and bring Sue on for a moment, Rapid fire response. What has you most excited moving forward in LAM research? Dr. Hamas, go. <laughs> I already said all my stuff. All stuff I said, everything makes me excited. Okay. It, it comes through, fair enough. <laughs> Dr. Hensky. Uh, I'm excited to see where the early stage investigators will lead us. They have a lot of enthusiasm and ideas. Great. Very good. Well, thank you both very much. This has been informative, insightful. It's exciting. It's inspiring. And I think I can speak on behalf of our full community on here this evening when I say thank you very much um, for all that um, you've put in over the years, all that you did to make the conference such a success, and for your generous time with us here this evening and throughout this series. And uh, so thank you very much. And with that, I would like to turn the mic over to our executive director and CEO, Sue Sherman. Thank you, Shar. Um, appreciate that introduction. Thank you, Lisa and Steve for uh, another uh, impressive and, and um, thought provoking discussion tonight. You guys are really our leaders and very gracious of you to um, rewind back to a few months ago and recap all the things that we uh, we learned when we were together. I also wanna thank Charlene um, for creating a flawless production uh, this evening. I think I almost did it, but no one had started talking without their microphone on. And that's uh, that has gotta be the sign of a great, a great video uh, meeting. And also to the full uh, LAM Foundation team. Again, you guys uh, just really created an incredible event tonight for Gosh, it's been between 175 and, and 200 people listening to this, and um, that is as large as Lamposium um, in, in many cases. So thank you all. Uh, you know, the, uh, the joy of working for this foundation and this community is evenings like this and understanding that there is brilliance uh, coming in every direction. And when we bring that together, that's when we make progress. I took so many notes this evening. <clears throat> And I've had about two minutes to to capture this, but there have been a few uh, things and 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 one liners that maybe will recap the night. Um, it's starting with with Charlene, who who came out with amazing, dense and accessible. Um, that's a pretty good uh, uh, synopsis of, of what just happened. <clears throat> but maybe a few of these will will resonate with, with you because they certainly have for me. Um, a river of ideas, um, a, a team, and, and we're rowing as fast as we can. Um, we are uh, seeking to eliminate lamb cells. Uh, we need more precise biomarkers. Uh, we're seeking healthy lungs and a cure for lamb. Um, 
this uh, community is unmatched and is my favorite conference. Um, bio may, biomarkers may come from the, the tumor cell or other cells. Um, men have estrogen too. <laughs> um, it's the high quality work in other fields will inform lamb. Um, ideas from people on planes. You never know, it may be what we need next. Um, excitement about understanding the immune system and LAM, harnessing the power of white blood cells. Um, cathepsins degrade bone and may also degrade lung cells. Uh, in person is better than Zoom. I'm gonna have to agree with that. Um, she met them all, the professionals, and came home really charged up to go to work. Um, can you sell your science in one minute? Steve says no. Now he says yes. Oh, I think what's most exciting in two years, the understanding the immune system, the technology of single cell data sequence, single cell sequencing data sets, and single cell sequencing data sets are yesterday's technology. That's really fast. Um, and uh, Cathepsin is like Drano. We have overwhelming gratitude uh, to women with LAM who have participated in clinical trials. And I think my favorite, um, and, and I learned something on every call, uh, is that kids and families are the coxswain. And I had to look that up, Steve. And this, <laughs> this is what Wikipedia says. What is the job of a coxswain? She is in charge of steering around obstacles, maintaining a safe distance between other crews and navigating turns on the course. I don't know that there's a truer metaphor than the role of patients and families in being the coxswain of this effort and the likelihood of our finding um, treat better treatments and a cure. So with that, I'm gonna return this back over to Charlene and say thank you to uh, everyone who has been on this call tonight and to keep keep fighting and keep contributing to the future because it is bright. Great. Thank you, Sue. And again, Dr. Hamas, Dr. Hensky, thank you very much for your time tonight. This has been fabulous. And I don't know if we can switch to gallery view quickly enough, Julie, before we stop the recording, but round of applause um, that I'm sure is happening out there and uh, very much appreciated. And we wish you a fantastic rest of your evening. Thank you for being with us tonight. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Char. You're, Char, you're a great moderator. I know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bro. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next bye -bye. time. Bye-bye.